Formula One is the most expensive sport on earth. Teams will burn upwards of $200 million per year, all in the name of engineering. But why? Just so we can get a copy-paste car reveal each year? I mean, spot the difference, bro. Such subtle differences. Rage baiting aside though, there are countless changes made to the cars each year. And unless you've got some serious wheel knowledge, Bang. well, of course I know it, he's me. A lot of these technicalities might seem irrelevant or straight up boring. <laughs> Never fear, F1 Yapathon is here. Rather than sitting through some boring mechanical engineering lecture to get your head around all of the weird tech lore in Formula One, I'm gonna compress this huge topic into three central components of speed. Those components are firstly creating the speed in the powertrain, then conserving that speed with aerodynamics, and finally harnessing that speed with the car's chassis. Also, don't worry, I'm not recreating my F1 vocabulary video. Uh, I've seen one of these before. This is a tire. <laughs> no, instead, I'll be focusing on the technical side of Formula One cars, so that next time Crofty starts wetting himself and throwing out some super niche buzzwords, you'll understand what he's actually cooking up. But no more intro yap. Let's go. Radio. Up first, we've got the powertrain. And in simple terms, this is essentially a Formula One car's engine. But at the same time, it's not. Confusing, right? Let me explain. Well, there's many parts here, exhaust, uh, exhaust pipes, turbo, combustion engine. That's right, Nico. F1 cars do have an internal combustion engine, but this is only one of the parts that make up the powertrain. I'm saying this because unlike most road cars that solely rely on dead dinosaurs, so I don't know, a Mazda CX-5, Formula One cars can generate speed in many different ways. And when you bring all of these methods together, you get what petrol heads call a power unit. Now, this next part might sound abstract, but stay with me here. What are, you, what are we talking about? I'm gonna explain the basic physics behind the hybrid side of the power unit. So, okay, there's two hybrid sources of speed, heat energy and kinetic energy. And these are converted into electrical energy to more or less give an F1 car a Mario Kart mushroom boost. Whoa! Right, so let's start with kinetic energy. The MG UK harvests energy when an F1 car breaks and stores it in the battery. So think of it this way. Lance Stroll is on 67 lap alt tires and he's driving cautiously. I'm struggling here. He slams on his brakes more often, which means that the MG UK is farming more of Lance's kinetic energy and converts it into electrical energy, which Lance hoards in the battery. It's sort of like charging up a power bank, only this battery pack is worth about one million dollars. And this isn't just some side quest to farm XP points during the race. All of the energy stored in the battery can be redeployed for a speed boost to help overtaking and defending. There's levels to the strategy game here, but the idea is pretty straightforward. In short, you know the battery graphic the F1 broadcasters just slap on your screen and don't really bother to explain? It just corresponds to what I explained now. The battery is either harvesting or deploying energy to make the cars go even faster. Anyhow, F1 drivers can charge up this power bank using kinetic energy from braking, like I just explained, but also with heat energy via the MGUH. However, as you probably know, F1 cars are getting a, uh, a new update in 2026, and you'll find somewhere in the patch notes that MGUH is getting nerfed and removed from the game, whereas MGUK is getting buffed by almost 300%. Oh. <laughs> yeah, I, I wouldn't know. Point being, seeing as the MGUH is getting vaulted in the new 2026 regulations, I don't want to overload your brains, so let's just put it aside. Okay, that pretty much is the foundation of the power unit. In case you got a little bit lost, here's a refresher. All of that hybrid slop plus the internal combustion engine equals the power unit. There's just one last thing to cover, the powertrain. Right, so here's the best way to understand this. An F1 car's power unit fundamentally has a thousand horses locked inside it. But that's it. All of this power doesn't mean sh** if it's stuck in there. This is exactly the problem that the powertrain fixes. It transfers all of this energy to the wheels. Now, I could drag out this video a few more minutes like another F1 slop tuber would by explaining how this energy transfer happens with the gearbox, drive shaft, clutch. Yap, yap, yap. Yeah, mate, take a trip to your garage and chances are that your Honda Civic 
also has all of these things. I'm trying to explain the F1 exclusive concepts here and condense this beefy topic into an informative watch. So yeah, drop a sub if you appreciate that. No more self plugs though, let's keep going. Alrighty, so now we're all familiar with how an F1 car creates speed, but how do they preserve this speed? Well, unfortunately, Formula One doesn't have a zero G Grand Prix in space yet, which means that all F1 teams are fighting a common enemy, air resistance. And this isn't just some side hustle either. Teams will spend millions on wind tunnels to ensure that their cars have a, uh, a healthy relationship with the air. And sure, some of you might be thinking, ah, uh, what's the big deal, bro? It's just air. If I was in the car, it wouldn't matter. <laughs> Simply put, an F1 car's aero setup determines if you're driving a Mercedes W11 or, I don't know, an Apex GP box. So let me explain why. What am I looking at here? Basically, as a Formula 1 car speeds up, air isn't air anymore. In fact, the drag that the air resistance generates can exceed 800 kilos of resistance, which means that the car is virtually towing an invisible adult-sized cow. No. Or, I don't know, Zach Brown. So. Understandably, engineers want to minimize the time lost to air resistance, and this is where the aero package comes in. It's also quite complex though, so here's another way to view it. Imagine the air attacking an F1 car. The aero package contains all of the car's defensive and offensive mechanisms. Right, let's start off defensive with the front wing. This is the car's main shield, as it deflects incoming air. However, it also redirects this airflow as clean streams toward the car's floor and side pods. Speaking of side pods, these are the other key defensive mechanism an F1 car uses to fight the air. Their purpose is to funnel the incoming air to the radiators that cool down the power unit and also reduce turbulence. Okay, so let's move on to the offensive mechanisms. I want you to picture the rear wing as a sword that cuts through the air. I don't remember. Which increases the car's grip around corners. Teams will also adjust the angle of the rear wing dependent on the circuit. So for example, in Monza, the sword's blade is very thin because teams prefer high speed over high downforce here. Whereas in Monaco, the sword's blade is thick, which sacrifices speed. But this gives the car a boatload of grip for all of the slow corners. Also, I can't imagine any of you still watching at this point don't know what DRS is. But for good measure, it just opens the car's rear wing, which reduces drag and gives it a speed boost. Simple. I gotta go fast. But this brings me to the final offensive mechanism of my uh, sword and shield R analogy, which is the trap. That's right, the air that passes underneath the car is weaponized and turns the car into a big Dyson vacuum cleaner. How you ask? Air flows faster underneath the car, which drops the pressure. Aero gods refer to this as the ground effect, which just means that because there's higher pressure on top, the car will get sucked to the ground. There's also this thing called a diffuser toward the car's rear that ensures that the air escapes this trap smoothly, keeping all of the suction. If teams get an A plus on their aerodynamics homework, the car almost appears glued to the track. But if the engineers were too busy scrolling reels and watching F1 Yapathon, well, you'll get porpoising, which will cause the Formula One car to bounce, like that one Maybach that every rapper has. Virgin approval! That's more or less the error package though. And even though all of the team's F1 cars look quite similar, each team will have their own designs for their shields, swords, and traps. You'll get some teams who are think inside the box and cook up the aero package equivalent of a two minute ramen. And then you'll come across some other teams who employ literal aero gods like Adrian Newey, who've already beat the game. Also, I'm aware that there's some other aerodynamic concepts I've brushed over, such as the beam wing, S duct, I don't know, the Y250 vortex, where is this? Don't worry, Lance. I don't know either. Well, I, I do, but look, as I said before, this isn't NASA mission control, and I am not Sheldon Cooper, okay? All I'm trying to do here is explain the general ideas. If you really want me to make a video about the F1 dictionary, just let me know, bro. But that's boring. Also, I highly recommend taking notes, mate. There's going to be a test at the end of the video. <laughs> Okie dokie, so we've looked at how Formula One cars create and preserve their speed, but what about harnessing this speed? Like what prevents the cars from incinerating when Prime Latifi drives over debris on the track? 
The short answer, a carbon fiber chassis stronger than Oscar Piastri's passion to fumble championships. All right, so this will be the last analogy I use in this video. Don't worry, my creative capacity has gone down the toilet. But anyway, if it helps, Think of an F1 car as that spooky human body mannequin that sits in the corner of every high school science classroom. The powertrain is the heart, the aero package is the lungs, and the chassis, that's the rib cage that holds all of the important stuff in place. Except the ribs, they're not flimsy bones. It's about half a million dollars of carbon fiber per chassis. Now, that might seem like quite a lot of money, but what if I told you that Formula One cars are like onions. Onions have layers. Formula One cars have layers. Onions have layers? You get it. Daniel Ricciardo is the GOAT. Subscribe to F1 Yapathon. Yeah, Shrek isn't wrong. A typical F1 car chassis will have 50 layers of carbon fiber, which can withstand impacts upwards of 50 Gs. 50 Gs? For reference, if you want to experience 50 Gs of force in your suburban prowler, you'd need to hit a concrete wall head on at about 100 kilometers per hour, which would total you and the car. Now, Apply that situation to a Formula One car, and yes, this happens. I'm gonna rage bait Team LH here and use the 2021 British Grand Prix as an example. So yeah, when the GOAT turned, turned in on me, man, his RB16 hit the barriers at 290 kilometers per hour, and he endured 51 Gs. Ouch. Ah. However, these carbon fiber skeletons are intentionally designed to be launched into walls like that. So consequently, Max walked away from that crash. The point I'm trying to make here is that if Max had hit that wall the same way in a Toyota Prius or something, yeah, GG's bro. You get the idea. A chassis is more or less a super durable shell protecting the interior of an F1 car. But there's more to it than that though. And this is where the car's suspension comes in. Right, so I know that I've said this about 50 times. Yeah, shut up! But seeing as 99% of cars have some form of suspension, I'm breezing through this concept. All you really gotta know is that the suspension connects the chassis to the four wheels, and its main purpose is to transfer the force from the tires to the chassis. Without suspension, the chassis would be rigid, like a Lego car meaning that it wouldn't absorb any forces and the slightest bump would send it into space. On that note, the suspension is also responsible for the weight distribution of an F1 car because every time the car moves around, so I don't know, braking, turning, strolling, whatever, the car's center of mass will shift around. Therefore, it's the suspension's J-O-B to ensure it counters these shifts by keeping all four tires glued to the track. If all of that went in one ear and out the other one, just remember the analogy I made like two minutes ago, bro. I find all this laughter to be highly illogical. If an F1 car was a human, the chassis is the skeleton and the suspension are all the muscles that absorb impacts. Simple as that. Oh, that's cute. You thought this video was over? No. <laughs> <laughs> nope. I haven't just spent 13 minutes of your time ranting about all of these technicalities for you to forget it all. Absolutely not. F1 Yapathon viewers are the smartest type of F1 fans. You smart. So to make sure that you learnt something, I've prepared a five question test for you. This is a closed book exam and it'll progressively get harder. So lock in, bro. Right, I'll stop hyping it up. Let's get started. Question one. In order to direct the 1,000 horses inside their power units, what object will an F1 driver grab? Steering wheel. Steering wheel. Yes, Carlos, it's the steering wheel. Good job. Question two. What does the acronym DRS stand for? No, Leela Lil 17. It does not stand for Danny Rick supremacy, but really good try. Like I called BS on that from the start. The correct answer was drag reduction system. Question three, what aerodynamic component would you find underneath an F1 car that sucks it toward the surface like a Dyson vacuum cleaner? Oh, no one wants to guess. All right, the correct answer was the diffuser. Question four, in the aerodynamic analogy of the shield, sword, and trap, what is the rear wing? Samurai mission, Alonso. Carlos, if you're gonna f around, you can leave the classroom, all right, mate? The correct answer was sword, bro. Samurais have katanas. You're losing me time if you keep commenting on my answers. Question five, how many subscribers will F1 Yapathon have before 2026? How am I supposed to know? 50,000 subs, join the movement.
Radio, class dismissed. Jokes aside, I hope that after explaining how F1 cars will create, preserve, and harness their speed, you've learned a thing or two. Also, here at F1 Yapathon, we believe in two things, Daniel Ricciardo's GOAT status and democracy. I love democracy. That's right. This video's topic was voted on by some of the 500 members and counting in our Discord server. <laughs> So, I don't know, I'll let Darth Vader take this one. Yo dudes, the F1 Yapathon Discord server is pretty chill. Maybe you could like join it or something. The only other thing you should join is my Patreon. I'll be dropping some exclusive audio Yapathons on there before big 2025 ends. Plus you'll get everything early. That's a wrap though. Cheers.